a movie with Elizabeth Hurley and the white boy from, uh, what's her name? Raymond Frazier. In the movie, she the devil, and she promising him, he tried to get this woman. She promising him to get his soul. And they dropping all this stuff about how they do with souls and stuff, and how they mix the, you know, they got to get enough souls and stuff. They did it in the movie of uh, uh, Wishmaster, uh, Wishmaster 1 and 2. Especially Wishmaster 2. But in the movie, she was like, he said, hey, I thought the devil was a man. She said, no, the devil was a woman. Because even in history, your original Satan is when the male all threw over the great mother, the great mother married Lucifer, tiny and all that became your prototype of Satan. Long before you had a masculine Satan in the, uh, in the Hebrew thing, the original Satan used to be the great goddess that was worshipped by male and female, but when the males took over, she became the first prototypes of Satan as the Vayamon, Tiamat, the Egyptian Apep, uh, a focus, a Typhon. You see what I'm saying? So she became the prototype of Satan. So in the movie, all of us a white girl, she playing Satan. Now, it's interesting because the white boy at the, almost the end of the movie, he ends up in jail. And when he ends up in jail as a black man, giving him the ins and outs on how to deal with Satan and telling him he got to deal with it from another philosophical perspective. And even Satan said, man, this thing ain't about no good and evil. This is about how you humans figure this damn bullshit out. She said that in the movie. At the end of the movie, when all well ends well, the devil, who was the white woman, well, hell, shit, that's the real devil, any damn reason. <laughs> Being that all your problem as a black woman is some crap, I got your man somewhere. See what I'm saying? On an epidemic level. Shit, that's enough to warrant Satan right there. Because, you know, that black man is gone now. Yeah. It's up to it's, This list alone on the moms that has gone to the other side is married generation. It's up to 156 people, and we got to add James Brown to that list. This motherfucker's 70. 72. Then married him a white woman. The Godfather of Soul, about two, what, a month ago? Two months ago, married him a white woman? Because he looked like an old black Chinese woman his damn self. But, um, this nigga done married, man, you know, so the list is up to 146 people. Huh? On the list, y'all want me to read the list again? Yeah. yeah, so, but anyway, but to get, to get through this, in the movie, at the end of the movie, they never said who the damn black man was. When, they, when the guy got in jail, he said that woman is Satan. Told him all about how to deal with Satan and all that. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So they're jumping around. Now, on one hand, we know that the original Satan is the throwing the overthrow of the black woman as the sacred supreme goddess. That's a different construct. But we know that if you talk about anybody that's the physical Satan, because they, they say Satan is a person that entices and lures. Well, goddammit, that white woman is king in that shit. Because yeah, yeah. that nigga seems to lose his damn mind when he comes to that white woman. Right. And he can be a goddamn PhD in physics, head of the UN or whatever, but when he comes to that white woman, she got that nigga. Yeah. So, if you want to talk about a physical one, in the context of moralism, if there's anybody that would be the epitome of Satan, it would have to be that damn white woman. Because she got the black man. So in the movie, he tell him, so the black man tell him how to deal with this, and at the end of the movie, they both playing chess. Satan and the black man, who represents who? God. That was the, that was the meaning of the whole book. It's called Bedazzle. You gotta see the movie. Bedazzle. Elizabeth Hurley and Brandon Frazier. In the end of the movie, when he went in jail, well, naturally, where did you find God? That's what they said in the book, The Nephilim, the one in the comic book store. And when you go get the movie, Unbreakable, they said, again, well, what Samuel L. Jackson told you, he told you what I've been telling you for years. Yeah, I believe anything that you really want to find, you go to the comic book store. Remember? Well, in this movie, well, in, in the comic book called The Nephilim, a cult role playing, the Nephilim are talking about the gods that used to rule prior to the creation of this realm or universe. They're called the Nephilim now. 
They said, well, where are them that? They said, you'll find the damn nephew in the jailhouse. They're talking about black men, black, black people, period. It will be the downtrodden. When he got in jail, he saw a black man. That's where black people are. And the black man was in jail telling him how to get, how to deal, how to deal with Satan, but he didn't miss the screw. He started with a nigga under the cell, under his bunk bed. And he missed the screw. He forgot to ask the guy who he was. And at the end of the movie, they told you who the black guy was. He was God. He was God. Remember now? That's the same thing they do to George Washington Masonic Memorial over there in Alexandria, uh, uh, Maryland. Is it Alexandria, Virginia, Maryland? Virginia. It's, it's, it's in Alexandria, Virginia. And on there, they got at the top floor, they got a bunch of white people reaching up in the air. They got a big black hand coming out. This is what all the Masons believe. The white races. So in this movie, they show the black man in Medazza. He's playing a chessboard. And they let you know that he's God. Because she's sitting on the side of the chest with a chest, with the ornaments or whatever you call them, all black, which always represents the dark side of the devil. In this case, they're talking, you know, in the moralistic terms. And he got these white ones, which represent the whole angelic host. And she stole one of his shit or whatever. The key to what I'm trying to say here is that they showed that the black man was God in the movie. And in the movie, that's what she was. They showed that you could never trust her in the movie. You see, but, the, but it's so, on one hand, the movie is dropping moralistically, but on the other hand, the movie is dropping on the metaphysical shit, like saying, this thing ain't even about no good and evil. It's about the battle of supremacy. Very key. That all right? Okay, let me give a, a, a one more thing. Okay, let me get this. Uh, I'm going to give this, I'm going to go with this history. I'm going to give some history of this Moorish history. We got a cup, we got a six cup on this, on this Arabic thing. So whenever you get the, the series on uh, Islam, the empire of faith, you can figure this thing up. You can figure this thing out. Uh, so I'm going to get it, let me give you the list again because uh, uh, I compiled it. Um, I got up to like a, probably about a 90 or 100 and then the brother uh, Daryl Rice compiled even more. Um, even more. So it's up to 156 people on this um, either married to some interracial thing. And you know what's interesting? You say, well, oh, man, you know, Bobby, you know, um, that's wrong because we all just love. We all just love each other. But it's interesting how uh, to this day in the history of white Hollywood, I can count two people on my hands. See, this is not a racial thing. This is a psychological thing. How is it that they say these cats, I mean, it ain't even about, they, these mugs is into white swapping and all that shit. That's why Will Smith got with Jada Pinkett. They say because if he goes both ways, he needs his wife to be in the same white swapping shit so it won't be no animosity. That's what the whole Tom Cruise, the Cole Kip thing. So it's a whole fraternity, fraternity out there. I'm not talking about the brother from Milwaukee. He, he was tall enough, he had all the shit, he got up out there, and he got up out there, and it, it ain't even about no gay shit. It ain't even about that, it's about some real deal, freaky deaky stuff. Right. You know, maybe some lizard up your innards or some kind of shit. You know, it's some real deal. You know, whatever it is, it's done going on, oh, you kissing some nigga. That ain't nothing. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is with the arm you swallowed some spit or something. This shit here is some bizarre stuff. You know what I'm saying? You might have to do a couple of mules or some shit. You know, and he said it was some wild stuff that they was gonna have him right there with Tom Cruise and all the rest of them if he had did what they said do. And that's how Will Smith can knock out each movie. These movies are down there. They're, um, a low budget movie is ten million dollars. That's what you low budget. There ain't no way in hell they gonna put this nigga, the top star of Dog on Independence Day, and it take about twenty-five, thirty million dollars to make a fucking movie. And you don't think that nigga ain't doing some, some shit. And that ain't just no kissing no nigga. You know what I'm saying? Cause that ain't nothing no more. We're talking about some animal bestiality shit. You know what I'm saying? We talking some koala bears, some whales, and some shit like that. You know what I'm saying? We talking some real deal Jimmy stuff. It ain't no, you ain't getting off cheap just kissing some nigga and he put me in some boot and some shit like that. Hey, you can do that shit for free. 
You know what I'm saying? On any call, ain't about that shit. It's about something that's bizarre. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, about some bizarre stuff. You know what I'm saying? Some real deal stuff that's so grotesque to all of those minds can't even fathom that. You know, some such another level of stuff. So, what I'm trying to tell you is if it's up to 150 cents, this shit ain't even got nothing to do even about no race shit. Because why is it that damn Tom Cruise and them can be in all the freaky shit they want to be into? Eyes wide shut. You see, some real deal stuff, but yet they tend that as an archetype to marry within their race. That's them universal because these people are deities. You understand what I'm saying? Even if you look at any dog on deity that's worshiping the ancient world, they are not even on the magnitude of universal level on the way these, these people are presented to the people around the world. Hell, if you even deal with the Jesus scenario, he didn't talk but a little room full of goddamn people his whole career. You understand what I'm saying? So my point here is this shit is about, that's why they say movie star. And a star is what a god. And they make sure you don't damn cross the line. You can do some shit. You can fuck all the black women you want. All black men, you when it comes to your archetype, you gotta understand you be in psychology. That's what the sister Kimberly was trying to explain. When they were saying she's gonna go into the goddess and she went into all this union psychology. When you go take get that shit with psychology, how many people ever studied psychology in damn college? If you studied some Carl Jung, hell no. Hell fucking no. They don't make sure you can go into that shit. Archetypal psych or psychology. You don't study that shit. You see what I'm saying? Cause that ain't no real psychology. That ain't nothing but just studying some sick motherfucker. And it ain't, you know, some you know, you know whatever the deal is, some fraud based but fraud was even into some metaphysical stuff. That's who taught you. But the point I'm trying to make here is you gotta understand the archetype. Now we're going to some archetype in a few minutes on how you don't think that racism exists no more and they didn't have to do nothing but get rid of the archetype. And once they got rid of the archetype, they can go on with racism. You will never be convinced that racism exists no more. You will because you're conscious, but the mass of the people, they don't see it. Especially if you see niggas fucking up every day, no way you're going to tell me that the white man is racist. But that's an archetype. So you got to understand archetypal, archetypal psychology. What is the image is everything. In a visual world, image is everything. The Egyptians showed you that. Well, they showed you the large monuments and even the writing was done in pictorial form. Okay? That's the archetypal aspect. Now, they don't doggone marry. If they are an image or archetypal, they make sure that they doggone get a woman that's the species hat in the same damn color. Now, we don't have that many niggas in, 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 in Hollywood. So to have this many people in Hollywood, and up to 150, 60, even with sports figures and singers or whatever, that means that 90% of them are, 98% of everybody is goddamn tiptoeing. You understand the Miss Daisy house, the driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> now, so let's go over this one more time, and I'm gonna go into that archetype thing, and I'm gonna go into this little history, and we're gonna go for a break, and we're gonna go back and we're gonna get into some deep stuff because we are in it now. And the only way you can survive, okay, before it was some shit, but see, when we went into this black hole, Time Magazine, uh, June 25th, put it on there, how the universe will end. This is Time, so this ain't just Bobby Hemmett with some guesswork to y'all. This is Time Magazine, and they're serious about this shit. We will go into this thing right here. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and I'm feeling the effects of it right now. We'll go into that. So we, we are really in this thing, and we hit the dead and center with this thing, front and center. Now, so the, 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 the list is, uh, they put it on the table again, James Earl James, Sidney Portier, Barbara McNeil. These are the ones, if you don't know, if you, you know, if you was born uh, before the 80s, you would know these. Scatman Crothers, well, Wesley Snipes, Warren, uh, Warren Dunn, Warwick, Warwick Dunn, Randy Moss, Lynn Whitfield, Gregory Hines, Naomi Campbell, Scotty Pippen, Robert Parrish, Casey Jones, Alvin Wood, Will Chamberlain, Tiger Woods, Snigger Woods, uh, Diana Ross, Nina Horn, Prince, uh, uh, Lat Latoya Jackson, Olivia Cole, The Rock, Roxy Rocco, Shaka Khan, uh, Herschel Walker, Ike Turner, Barry Barnes, Adam Clayton Powell, LaVar Burton, Louis Gossett, Ben Marine, uh, Mariah Carey, Al Jarreau, Rosie Greer, J. 
They can't come to you. I didn't say it's certain, but they said Henry Louis Gates, either you was with one, either you ain't with one, but you was with one in the past. D. Brown, Marcus Allen, Sly Stone, DJ Armstrong, Kofi Annan, Sammy Davis Jr., Dr. Dandridge, Pearl Bailey, Herbie Hancock, Red Fox, Erica Alexander, Zan Alexander, uh, Lawrence Phillips, Lynn Moody, Quincy Jones, Billy Blanks, uh, uh, Billy Banks is whatever, uh, Dennis Rodman, Ray Allen, uh, Grover Washington, Mario Van People, this list keep getting, Melvin, no, excuse me, Melvin Van People, this list keep getting big and bigger, Donna Summer, Stacey Dash, Maya Angelo, Lee T. Price, Michael Jackson, Devin Thomas, Carl Weathers, Nell Carter, Jimmy Hendrix, Yepaki Hoto, O.J. Simpson, Deborah Reese, Frank Thomas, Glenn Rice, Billy B. Williams, Fred Williamson, uh, Frederick Douglass, Ray Donald Trump, we even got a historical nigga got that tiptoe. George Stanford Brown, Dennis Green, Sinclair Trick, Reggie Jackson, Lila Rashawn, Coolio, Danny Manning, Vanessa Williams, tiptoe one time, Tatiana Ali, uh, and we could even put your girl on it, she, she's slobbing down the white boy right now, um, Venus Williams. Oh. Yeah, no, oh. totally. Oh. She's the end of the world. Uh, 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 okay, Fran Fanon, Franz Fanon, Harold Belafonte, Leslie Ovens, Jack Johnson, uh, Lonnie McKee, Montel Williams, Kim Fields, Cooper Gooden Jr., Sonny Rollins, Iman, Tay Diggs, Charles Barkley, Bill Russell, Anna Marie Johnson, Richard Pryor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, this is everybody in the damn world here, shit. <laughs> we the fucking damn dinosaurs. Tandy Newton, Diane Carroll, Puff Daddy, Janet Jackson, uh, Darian Haywood, Whoopi Goldberg, Matt Sinclair, Lou Rawls, Richard Roundtree, Tina Turner, uh, Roger Root, Clarence Thomas, uh, Rick James, uh, Linda Clifford, Angela Davis, Paul Abdul, Tukey Smith, Denise Williams, uh, Nolan Richardson, J.A. Rogers, Todd Bridges, uh, Lafonso Ellis, Mookie Blaylock, Quinn Buckner, Bill Cartwright, Bobby Farron, Alice Walker, damn, ain't that me? everybody in the shit, everybody we ever know, Nikki Giovanni, Barry Gardner, no, I don't think that we did, Barry Gardner get something. I don't know. I don't want to put nothing down that I can shoot. Barry Gardner tip broke through the tools right recently. You see what I'm saying? A uh, large fish burn, he was going, he was bedating one. Um, Kobe Bryant, Russell Ellington, uh, Leroy Jones, Tavia, uh, Tavia Butler, uh, Rob Millie, that's the damn Millie with Millie boy. Jonathan Butler, well the other one had it too, both of them. Millie and Millie. Uh, Jonathan Butler, Professor Griff, she don't have had one of those when we was, um, Brian Gumbo, Duncan is that one? This homework I've been doing is homework. Duncan is saying he's so.
Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So now, uh, I want to get into two aspects of this history day. A uh, few other things we want to deal with. First of all, um, we forgot that this is the this is the 20th year anniversary this spring that Bob Marley died. That was like spring 1981. And he died right around the same time uh, that Princess Diana was getting married. Now it's interesting, and I just, it's interesting here because I can't help, help to notice that during the 70s, his music never broke in the United States until 1980 uprising. All the other people was hip to him, but as far as phenomenon, uprising was his first album to break in the United States, and a couple of months later, he was dead. You see what I'm saying? And uh, a couple of months later, he was dead. Very key. Um, so it's, you know, uh, uh, very key. Um, now, also, see, that's why, why do you think, when I'm talking about that archetype thing, why do you think they keep Elvis alive? Elvis is probably known to your children, and Elvis has been dead 25 years, not 20, yeah. Well, 1997 is what? 1977, 19, 1977, how many years? Dude, what's that? About 24 years. But yet he's alive. That's an archetype that can deify somebody. Hell, even if you look into, even if any God that you worship, in, uh, uh, even the ones that died, supposedly Jesus or Osiris or whatever, they've been dead for thousands of years. But yet they are alive and well. That means that that is an archetype and that is the Christ vision. Now, let me show you about archetypes. An archetype is an image that is planted in the mind. And you'll get into the whole archetypal thing in Jungian psychology. Um, in Jungian psychology. Um, there's a book called Archetypic or Archetypes and Collective Unconsciousness. Now, this archetype is, um, this archetypal realm is planted and it is the images and everything is image. Just like right now, um, right now here's an archetype. If you've never been in a BMW, Mercedes Benz, or whatever, you think in your mind that that is a superior ride. Until when you get in one, it's really nothing. It ain't no different than a fucking Saturn. <laughs> but to people who never been in one, it's a superior ride. You understand what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, the archetype tends to wear out. Why you think people who work their life to get something, and once they get it, it becomes nothing, and they got to go on and get other things? You see? Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. Shit, you get a goddamn 1970 deuce and a quarter, and riding that shit, that big ass float machine, it rides smoother than that damn Mercedes and that shit you got now. Them fucking Delta 98. Before you used to have a car, you couldn't even hear the fucking outside. You be doing 400 and shit, and thinking you're doing 65. Remember them big, you know, cars like that? So my point is, luxury is, and, and at that time, your Cadillacs and all that shit was American standard. And they used to laugh at foreign cars. You see what I'm saying? People for fail to notice. Right now, one of the best cars you can get is a Toyota or a Honda, bar none. They say shit. It is hard to tell you right now, you want to get a motherfucking car, get you a damn Toyota or a Honda. That's why they're, they're the best cars in the world. But people don't know if Honda was a motherfucking damn motorcycle company. People forget that shit. For most of my life, Honda was a goddamn motorcycle company only. Y'all, some of y'all remember that shit. You say Honda, a bike came to mind. Fucking motorcycle. But now, the best car they say in the world is a fucking Honda or a goddamn Toyota. Bottom line, we I got a boy to sell cars, he's saying it right now. The only cars that cost a little more money to get past all that bullshit is a Honda and a goddamn Toyota. See what I'm saying? And they used to laugh at them shits back in the damn 72. <laughs> Good duty bugs. You know, and then that damn Honda was a motorcycle company. So, the, so we talking archetypes. We talking doggone status symbols. You see, we talking status symbols. You get where I'm coming from here? So now, let me give you an archetype. An archetype is something 
that is said, as soon as it's said to you, it will produce a certain response. Now, all of a sudden, and I remember when, it really, when they really started tapping into this shit, it was around the O.J. Simpson trial where this word N-word started coming up. Boy, these white people done invented a new word. It's called the N-word. And white people now are quintessential on not calling you a nigga. As a matter of fact, there was a show on PBS where a white man was red steaming because this black guy was saying nigga, nigga, nigga. And the white man was offended. <laughs> the white man was shaking in his boots. <laughs> this is the archetype. Somebody call you a nigga, it might sound like a doggone accent or something. It might sound like a motherfucker call you a nigga. <laughs> it just depends on the psychological aspect. And we know that some people oh, don't like to be called niggas and all that kind of shit. But what I'm trying to say is, if we don't turn the damn word around, it means something totally different. And we know it might be on the inferiority, whatever the damn origins. We know, we're trying to show you with every damn crap to call you a nigga. We all know that. This is fundamental. The point I'm trying to make here is this. They got together and they say we can eliminate racism only on the apparent level. And racism can go on even more strenuous and brutal than it did prior to what they did. And the only thing they had to do was eliminate the archetype of the N-word, the nigga coming from white people's mouth. Because the white person called you a nigga and it automatically give you a response. So they can take an archetype, make it taboo for America or American whites to say. Meanwhile, you use it every damn day. And they have eliminated it, and because they have eliminated the archetype subconsciously, they can eliminate racism in the minds of dead people. You see? And it can be, go down to the point where as, in racism now, you have to find out a sophisticated way to tell a goddamn nigga he oppressed. <laughs> or he been discriminated upon. And when you tell him, the nigga might go, huh, you think so? Well, I don't think so. You know? So they got to go and train a black person on how he has been discriminated against. Literally. All because he is not hearing the overt form of racism that he was accustomed to. You see what I'm saying? Pre-civil rights, you understand? And civil rights help. So the only thing they can do is they can eliminate the archetype to the point where as if you don't hear it in 10 or 15 years with white people, then when a black person come around and start talking about how white people ain't shit, black people like, this nigga here is fucked up. Case in point, get mind your goddamn family members who are unconscious. You sound like a nigga coming from another planet talking shit about white people. Whereas just 20 years ago, just 20, it wasn't nothing you said. Everybody knew it was a consensus that white people wouldn't buy shit. But now, it, shit, we are conscious. I get a bad taste in my mind to call a white person something. And I'm conscious. Can you imagine what a dead ass nigga out here doing? You see? So they can invent an archetype in a mind control situation whereas racism don't exist because the white man say it don't exist. Right. And he's done it because he's eliminated the archetype of him saying nigga. You ain't heard it in 10, 15, 20 years. And that's all it takes. That's the fucking archetype. You get how that thing goes? You see? That's how it, that, that's how it goes. That's the mentality. When you see the dazzle, they go show the white boy, he said, I want to be a damn Michael Jordan. So they make him a big old tongue, blonde white boy with a big old box face. He jumping and dunking and shit, and they go to the interview. And while the interview going, they show him talking, and he just got these gobs and gobs of sweat just dripping down his face like buckets. And he got all these cliches. They tell him something, he got team effort, team this, 100%. Bob, like, what's his name? Last year, he learned how to say a little more shit this year. Somebody must have coached him. It was Shaquille. When a motherfucker tell you something, it ain't about your A game. We got our A game, and I had to come with my A game other than my B game. That's like, 
Legos are putting some blocks together, nigga. So this shit was a little bit better. Somebody must have pulled that nigga aside and say, look, when somebody address you, it ain't about your A game or your B game. Try to give a little bit of conversation. So this year, so they must have took that nigga to some coaching school and taught that nigga how to say a couple of more syllables. You see, a cipher a little bit, as Jeff O'Bodine would say. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is, they show it in the movie where the ball, and they, they make it fun, they always make fun of black people. And the whole concept. Now, I want to get into this one, I want to get into this one last thing. Uh, one last thing here. Uh, uh, to try to understand, uh, there was a, the con there was a thing that came on, let me go, go into a break, then we're going to come back and please stay around because we got to, uh, please stay around because, um, uh, there's, uh, there's some real serious stuff going down and we are, we are in it. We've been in it since March 21st and you got to, we got to really deal with this particular information. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about something that's a fact that I'm talking about some stuff that I go through every night I go to bed. So I'm telling you, this, this thing is unbelievable. Now, uh, the, 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 the show, Islam, the Empire of Faith, is a, is a, it was a, a PBS special. And number one, they literally proved that they were educated by the Arabs, that the European was brought their education by the Arabs. They just don't say the word Moors. But the entire, it's a good documentary because the entire part of Europe and its relationship was based on the Moors bringing architecture and civilization and education to the dog and white people. So they proved the whole Moorish paradigm even in their own way, they just didn't say the word more, but they, they, they mentioned Cordoba, Spain, and they mentioned the whole Spain thing. You see, they just don't say the word more. They would talk about the, the Arabs, the, 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 the Spanish Arabs or the Arabs in Spain. But the concept is what you've got to understand when you get a chance to see this documentary, that the entire conquest of Europe that they're talking about that's supposed to be Arabs, white Arabs, is 85% blue black Arabs. That's what you gotta understand. Now, they said that how they got their education was that after Muhammad uh, brought Islam to the Arabs, and after the holy wars of Mecca and Medina, and they established the Islamic faith. They said that Islam started conquering the Western world. He said that the first thing they did was that they got, they got a hold to the Hellenistic writings and texts of Hellenistic, which is Greece and Rome. In this case, Greco-Roman writings, mathematics, and all of the science coming from the Hellenistic world. Now wait a minute. This is a contradiction. Number one, they said that they conquered these lands, and from the conquest of these lands, they were able to take the information and cultivate it, or preserve it, and use it as a teaching force for later Europe. There's only one problem with this. They didn't conquer Greece or fucking Rome. You see? But they omitted the fact in the movie, uh, excuse me, in the documentary, they omitted the fact that they conquered Kemet of Egypt. Here's the biggest conquest of the entire Arab world. Because until that time, up until that time, it doesn't matter. Egypt was still seen as the pinnacle of civilization. Now see how they back talk. Now they got all these scholars in a consensus to bring you this bullshit. Because when they make the documentary, they call them in and say, look, this is the angle we going. So therefore, we don't want you to slip up on this damn tape and come up with some other shit outside of the way we want to bring it. It's like that Napoleon thing. Now here goes the Napoleon thing. They didn't even talk about how he even the buttons this 
motherfucker sold on his one. They even went down to the buttons on his damn uniform. They ain't left no stones unturned in the Napoleon thing, but failed to mention that he got into a war with Haiti. They didn't even talk about how he even the buttons this motherfucker sold on his one. They even went down to the buttons on his damn uniform. They ain't left no stones unturned in the Napoleon thing, but failed to mention that he got into a war with Haiti. Now here it is, they got his defeat, and you mean to tell me that you, he got it, he gets into a war with Haiti, and they failed to mention the campaign against Haiti and lost? But this is where you know that it's a conspiracy. If, see, this is how white, first of all, white people don't, they don't, they, they seize the opportunity to tell you about their greatness and their historical endeavors. If they would have told about the Haitian campaign, it would have set up the American link between the great conversation between Napoleon and Thomas Jefferson, which is supposed to be one of the biggest crackers in dog on American history. You know, because he, he went to Thomas Jefferson and told him they got to send troops and try to fight in Haiti, or they got to make sure that they, they, they uh, uh, send troops to dog on the, to the French territories of them. Of uh, New Orleans and all that, they say because if you don't, New Orleans is gonna be speaking doggone French in a damn year. Speaking, speaking French in a doggone year, because the Haitians spoke French. You see, and they say that they, two sides and death are leading them like last year when it come to doggone New Orleans next. Now this is some historical shit to put in the documentary. After all, this is the documentary about Napoleon. First of all, they uplifted an antichrist and made him a noble person. In the thing. Okay, in the documentary. So they failed to omit stuff. So here it is again. They omit the whole Kemet conquest, which is the biggest conquest of Arab history, is when they took Egypt. Oh, but see, if you put Egypt on there, if you put Kemet up in there, if you tell the truth, they didn't conquer Rome and Greece. So there was no way they could have access to Hellenistic. Text. See how they lie? They said they took Hellenistic texts, took them to Baghdad, and translated them. Wait a minute. They didn't conquer no damn Greece and Rome. You see, the Rome, it was a weak empire. The Rome, Romans were still a little strong at the time. It was under the Pope and all that, but they still were strong. They were, Constantine and all them others were strong enough to kill up all the people. They were still strong in the 6th century AD. Key here was the mystery here is that a hundred years prior to the Arabs coming, the Egyptians they understood history at the later temples, the temple of Esna, the temple of Isis at Philae, the temple of Dendera, the temple of Kolombo, the temple of Horus at Edfu. These temples, these later temples. Although the Temple of Dendera was torn down from a more ancient temple, these temples, Temple of Hathor at Dendera, Temple of Horus at Edfu, the Temple of Esther, the Temple of Isis at Philae, these particular later temples, for 100 or 200 years, they translated Metanel, which is from Haradim, the Mahdi, and the Hieroglyphic script, they translated these things into Arabic. Because Arabic, believe it or not, they said if you really, this is what the Egyptologists say, if you really want to know how the Egyptians speak, the closest thing they got to it is Arabic. And hard, but Arabic, they said that it, it so now you gotta remember now, Arabic, the language predates the white Arab. The white Arab is a caveman can't speak. Get Drew Silas, Dundee, Houston's book, Wonderful Ethiopians in the Kushite Empire. Arabia was what? Kush! Northeast Africa! Separated by what the Suez Canal? A man-made ditch. Right? So, Arabia was Kush as well as India. This is how you have you get Kush, they call them Kushite Arabians. You get your whole Sufi order, which was an Egyptian order. 
Because we're talking about the same damn people. Why when they go to get this, this group of Hebrews from South Africa called the sinners, they trace their shit to Arabia. And these are Negroid looking people. You know? Now, so they translate the Metaneta into Coptic, which is later day Egyptian, Arabic, Hebrew, they talk, they, they, basically the existing uh, languages around it, Amharic, Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, it was an existing language, which is a black language, he trusted Greek, Hebrew, Coptic, and Latin. So, they knew, based on prophecy, that the later day people was going to conquer, and they would have no problems translating the existing languages. So, the Arabs conquered Egypt. The existing priests in Kemet or Egypt at the time, at the time, were with the Arabs who was the new conquerors, and they translated all these ancient texts. This is the missing piece on an ancient or missing piece. And that ancient text, those Egyptians, after translating all the existing texts from, from all the other ones into Arabic, into Arabic, those, those Egyptians or Camites went into Europe. The word more also, the word means Lord of the earth, and we, and still, these people that we call Egyptians or Africans had different multiple names. We might call them, Kim and Akam just means black man or black face one, Ethiopian and Ethiopian means black face one. It don't necessarily mean, they had different names. They went by the priesthood. They called themselves Typhonians, Moors. You see what I'm saying? Shusin Hall, which is your Greek, which is your your uh, uh, Hebrews. You see what I'm saying? They got different names and stuff. So my point here is, they told the truth when they said that there was a place. They said it was in Baghdad where they translated the Hellenistic world, but they didn't translate no shit from no Greece because they didn't conquer Greece and Rome. They conquered Kemet, and the stuff was already translated into into these different later day languages. And as a result, the ruler of Kemet at the time, which was Arabic, translated all of it into Arabic. And they didn't do it because the savage people didn't do it. It was the Egyptian priest, which was the Moors. You see? And the Sufs, which means woolly-haired one. And they went on up into doggone Europe. So the only thing you got to do is, is whenever you see the empire in faith, of faith, Islam the empire of faith, the documentary, just remember two things. Every Arab that you see in connection with Europe is Moors. All of it. The Sultans and all that. That's the first thing you see. What the white Arabs? The white Arab was a savage, couldn't teach nobody nothing. All right, that's the first thing you want to think. Yeah. No. This next thing, when it comes to the intellectual development from ancient culture into Arabic, it was coming out of ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet. That's what you gotta understand. That's the key when you see this particular part. A couple other things right here. I want to give a couple. I want to give other things, and we're gonna go into uh, we're gonna go into a break. Uh, when you want to break? How much time you got? When you want to break? It's nine o'clock. So we got three hours. Oh, got three hours in already? No, I'm saying we got three hours left. Yeah, but how many? How much time is this already? So far, we got um. About three hours, yeah. About three hours, cool. We're going to break it a few minutes. I'm going to get this one thing that we got to understand here. All right. A movie you want to go see is Welcome to the Dollhouse. So there's some movies that you want to see. Get a movie called Welcome to the Dollhouse. A little bit about a little white girl. But every little damn thing he on humanity is thrown into her life. It's funny as hell. There's a lot of shit going on up in there talking about the psychological. See, they got a lot of psychological movies that is not just white people, but you can learn more about what goes on in white people. You can be riding by the big ass houses and getting jealous. 
You can learn a lot about what goes on with white people by listening to their movies that they put out about how crazy they are. A couple of movies you want to get that why, why you're crazy, imitate them, find out what's behind them. Then you'll find out the same shit going on in your family. You need to get home for the holidays. Classic movie. Because we all got some fucked up people in our family. And it ain't the damn crazy person either. It might be that mama and that daddy that you couldn't figure out, or that sister, or that brother. You want home for the holidays. Another movie, classic movie, talking like how you gotta get the movie Mother. Movie Mother, but I wasn't that woman, Debbie Reynolds. Wanna get that movie, Mother. You also wanna get the movie Welcome to the Dollhouse. Very key, you get that movie. This is on a psychological round. That back to the dollhouse is some funny shit though. Alright, it's a funny ass movie. This little white girl, shit be happening this little white girl. She just be looking at the camera and be like, I know this damn shit didn't happen to me. <laughs> Meanwhile, you got a little, a, little, a, little, a little girl, a little sister, this little ballerina, and the mommy and the daddy tends to love her more. Another movie you need to get is American Beauty. And they got mad at that cracker from. He from right out of here, some part in Georgia. He wrote that movie and they got mad at his ass. He said, no, this is the damn world I grew up in. So they want to bring this utopian society down and got you thinking that niggas are all fucked up. Humanity is fucked up. That's the end of the humanity. All right. Well, you want to get that welcome to the dollhouse. Uh, 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 that welcome to the dollhouse. Uh, now, uh, there's a good movie on alchemy and the longevity of melanin in a movie called Kronos. Get that movie, Kronos. It's a, it's a foreign movie, but it's dull. Also, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Get that. Uh, if you got a DVD, you can get the dub version. But uh, in there, uh, 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 Crouching Tiger, there's a lot of stuff going on up in that particular aspect. Uh, one, of the, one of the big instances is the whole concept went on in, in the Matrix. When they were fighting in the Matrix, he said, you got it, but your problem is not in your technique. So he had the technique down, Pat, but, but his mind wasn't ready yet. Same thing with this girl that kicked the whole town ass. What she said, she is the desert, sword, what was it? The, the, the sword, the desert sword boy. No, the desert sword goddess. That's Kali. Kali is called, she kept, it's called the sword of Kali, so she was Kali. And she was rebelling against the order of patriarchal, saying they gotta marry her off and all kind of crazy shit. And that motherfucker kicked every man ass in the damn town. She was on her way to being a master. She was the guy said, but if you he couldn't be be a uh, child young fat. Because he had the mental thing, but she had the techniques down. Very key movie. Uh, very key movie. That's the movie of Kali. Now, one other thing I want to get into before we go to this, this break. And that's another thing which is also. You get a part of it in my, 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 my tape, the origin of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but I want to get into this, I want to get into this one little thing to, to, to hone in to what really went on here on how your police force is, the organization is the Klan itself, not in the aspect of they treat you a certain way, but the organization itself is, um, is, uh, uh, an extension of the Ku Klux Klan based on fraternal order. Its charter is from the Ku Klux Klan. Well, now you got the Klan was started by the Anti-Defamation League and uh, Scottish Rite Freemason Albert Pike. It starts the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan is number one a noble organization that has its roots going back to Moorish Spain. Spain. Because the, not the little old holes burning in the damn sheets. That's for the riffraff, the night riders, some old motherfucker. That they just get off the street tend to put on the sheet. But the Ku Klux Klan regalia is a Moorish outfit, the one with the Grand Dragon whip, with the satin and all the hooked up shit, even the symbology and all that stuff, is, um, that's Moorish regalia with the pine cone hat, with the cone shaped hat. Is, 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 uh, uh, you also see the same one in um, 
Richard Noon's book, I Thought You a Disaster, they got a picture of, a, of, a, of an Egyptian ceremony going on in the temple, in the pyramid. It was given to him, Richard Noon was given, uh, uh, Richard Noon is a big time mason. And uh, he's got one of those pictures up in there. So, that has his origin from Moorish Spain. That's the upper echelon of the clan. Now, your night riders or your foot soldiers was in pre or uh, what you call post post confederacy or post confederate south. You had the law enforcement just like you had out west. You had a marshal and you had a deputy. And whenever something went wrong, they would get together a posse. And the posse would be your foot soldier or your strong armed force to go after criminals and fugitives. Just like you would have out west. You'd have a marshal and you would have a deputy. And whenever they wanted, or maybe two deputies, but whenever they wanted to get us some people that get together a posse. You see what I'm saying? Now, that's the way it was down south. Because how the hell you think, who the hell you think migrated the damn west? Was half southerners. The northerners was rich, blue blood, elite. Okay? So down south you had a deputy, you had a sheriff, and you had a posse. You know, the posse was pending. Okay. When they decided that they needed to police Negroes, the first police force was the Ku Klux Klan, which was the foot soldiers, because your police force is different than a deputy and a posse and a sheriff. It is a fraternal order. Well, in that case, what the fuck you got a sheriff? Why, why you got a sheriff running around here in some brown outfits? And you got a police force. And why is the sheriff department smaller than the police department? Your police force is a fraternal order. And the fraternal order of the southern jurisdiction, which is a Masonic fraternal order, was the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? So a police force being a fraternal order was the Klan. And later on, that fraternal order went to a military style or paramilitary style. You understand what I'm saying? One is mid 19th century version, one is turn of the century version. It's the same fraternal order of the Ku Klux Klan. You get it? When you got the marshal and you got the posse, that's a different entity alone. Then you have a fraternal order. That's what gets organized from the side. They didn't have no police force like that. The fraternal order was the Ku Klux Klan. It's a Masonic order. That is the same order to when they looked up in the 1920s, in the 30s. They had a, and after the Civil War, after the World War II, they had a major influx of blacks going out west. And on PBS, when they gave the history, they said, who trained the LAPD to handle blacks? They said when they had the, when they looked up after World War II, they didn't know how to handle blacks. They had to import Klansmen of the paternal order of the South to teach them how to handle niggas. Okay? How to handle Negroes in the West. That's why the book, that's why the movie that uh, Mount Marvin Van Peoples put out, Mario Van Peoples put out, called Illegal in Blue. It was when they was they was got they, when they went to the under echelons of this police order. It was the Klan. Hey, um, uh, hey, uh, tell her that's the uh, that's my guest. Uh, that brother there is the first brother that uh, turned me on to consciousness when I was dead. Yeah. Now they had a uh, police. They had a. They had a. Uh, they had under echelon in the fraternity. They had a. Uh, when they went in and they, they had all these these, these killings. Then when it was a Ku Klux Klan civilization up under the police force of so y'all on LAPD. 
bandits from the Ku Klux Klan. And it's the same fraternal order as the LAPD today. That's what people don't understand. Before that, they had sheriffs, deputies, and posses. The fraternal order of policemen came from the Scottish Rite Freemasonry of the of, of Southern jurisdiction of the Klan. They had them lobbies and shit in England. They didn't have no police state up north. You see, not like they got now, but that shit is the Ku Klux Klan of the Southern jurisdiction based on Rene 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 Briff, anti-defamation league, and the union between those two, because they were Southern slaveholders out of Charleston, South Carolina, and Albert Pike. And that's the whole key to this shit. The whole paternal order on how that whole thing goes down. On how that, that, that entire thing goes down. Uh, that whole paternal order. Uh, you know, so what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna, um, um, uh, like I said, this brother here uh, turned me on to consciousness uh, about 14, 15 years ago. We used to have a job at working at the damn post office. Woo! Like I said, after working at the damn post office, when a motherfucker go postal, I just shake my head and go, I understand, brother. I understand. I understand. We was working as students. That we was going to Clark. We was working as, as, as students and stuff. Uh, and um, um, and, and um, uh, we used to work out at the post office and stuff. And we uh, and the brother is the first person to uh, drop science on my ass. You see what I'm saying? So everybody got a starting point. And uh, everybody got a starting point and stuff. Uh, but that brother been in it for years and shit. He was one of the youngest Black Panthers and shit. Uh, so he's been he's been in he's been in the struggle for years and shit. He's a he's molded and mildewed in the struggle. <laughs> you know. So anyway, um, um, uh, let me see. I want uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a few other things too. Another movie that they will never put out. If you can get your hands on Sugar Hill, Sugar Hill came out in the seventies. Old fine ass Foxy Mama, her brother got killed. And she went to the, the grandmama that worked in the Jeffersons, who was on the Jeffersons, and she was a voodoo priest, and they conjured up the dead, the god of the dead. We're going to get into some of that tonight also, too. That's another movie they won't put out. Just like Spooky said by the door, you know, there's some of these movies, every now and then they hit the mark, but another one, 1975, was, um, 74 was Sugar Hill. And, um, uh, uh do, but do they have that, do, can you get that in Black Summer somewhere? Cause I got a copy. There's a brother up some, in New York. They could, well, that's fucking New York. Somehow I didn't get anything. So a brother sent me a copy of this shit. And it's in good shape. But in there, in there, uh, uh, but see, this is good. Cause you know they had a movie where she'll do the, they'll do the voodoo, and at the end, uh, good always prevail and stuff. You know, and they always have them. Cause you no, know, in this shit here, they killed up everybody. And for the present, they took a little white girl. Took her to the damn kingdom of the dead. But uh, in this movie here, it was straight up vindication. Just like I'm spooked to set by the door. Every now and then, ain't, ain't none of that, oh, you know, uh, we be all the world shit come on at the end. No. She got the doggone vindication on this one. Uh, and that's another movie, Sugar, uh, 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 Sugar Hill. Uh, that's another one that you uh, that you also need to get also, too, is, uh, is that one. Uh, now, I'm going to show you something here. Here's a movie. Here's a book. And... All the brothers need to get this book, and the sisters. Um, I mean, this book here, this book here is the, this book here is the shit. Apparently, different orders, the martial arts went to the brothers in Asia, and, you know, they came out of Africa. You know, that whole thing. There's mysteries on love. You know, that, see, the stuff that the, that the, that the that Christianity talks about is only a fragment. So therefore, anytime you just get a fragment of something, it's misconstrued. So you end up loving motherfuckers you don't supposed to love. You know what I'm saying? Somebody blow your daughters up in the bottom of a goddamn church. And you're supposed to love that shit. And I still want to know what's the justification because a nigga got a BMW? Or is that worth a what four black girls dying in the bottom of a church? I don't buy that shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm like Dr. Ben, I ain't got no goddamn scruples. You know what I'm saying? I don't buy that. So that means that somebody's taking principles and their esoteric principles and they're blowing them out of order in this moralism shit and you round this motherfucker loving the enemy. 
But the mysteries of these things, even the Bible might give you a parable. That means there might be a whole other mystery to this shit. And you miss it tomorrow because you got some old stupid ass nigga on Sunday telling you this shit here and all. And he's just quoting what some motherfucker told him in the Freedmen's Bureau. And there's a whole other mystery of that stuff. The thing you need to get is this book called Love is a Fire, Sufi's Mystical Journey Home by Lou Ellen Von Lee. This book is the shit. This is the one to get. I'm going to go into a little bit of this when we come back. Um, this is the movie to get. I mean, excuse me, this is the book to get. Uh, on the mysteries of love. The first concept is, is the union, you have to union with a physical person to understand that mysticism. But you've got to understand something. Once this shit is turned on, it becomes a, a like a realm or a uh, a dimension unto itself, and you can always goddamn go there. Some badass shit. And what it does is, if you follow the past, it neutralizes the ego. You see what I'm saying? It neutralizes the ego and it neutralizes reasons. See, when you start to reason with shit, you can think of a hundred reasons why somebody fucked up. But if you take a deep breath and let the flow hit your ass, you know what I'm saying? It will neutralize all that. You see? It will neutral. And that's what they deal with in this particular thing. It's called love is a fire. This is the Sufi shit right here. But most of the Sufi books, they give you a lot of stuff in poetic stuff and it's not broken down. This boy breaks this thing down. He got two of them, but this is the best one. Love is a fire by Llewellyn Vaughn Lee. So that's, this, this, this is good for a lot of sisters because a lot of sisters can't find no man. But you don't understand, if you've ever been in love before, they say it never goes away. It's always, it is for you, for, it's with you with the rest of your life. You just got to tap back in that dimension. You've done this shit when you heard a fucking song. Or you smelled some food you ain't smelled in 15 years. You know what I'm saying? You might go back to your mama house, and she might have some old ass perfume that she had in the bottom of the drawer for goddamn 30 years. You smell that shit, and you go on a whole nother.